A blessed good morning to all of you. And of course, we will honor our moms today. In fact, moms, I'm giving you advance warning. At the end of this message, we'll be asking you later to stand for prayer, and then you'll be serenaded with a song from Harvest. And, uh, you know, in the GCF tradition, when we have Mother's Day, it is never limited to just biological and adoptive moms. You need to know that because we'll be asking you to stand later. We also honor and especially honor spiritual mothers. If you've ever led anyone to the Lord, I don't care if you're 10 years old, you are a mother. Because to lead somebody to the saving knowledge of Christ is every bit as difficult as giving birth. And raising that spiritual child is as difficult as raising a biological child. So later, biological, adoptive, and spiritual moms, we greet you. Happy Mother's Day. And we'll honor you by making you pray, stand as we pray for you. I want to ask you a question as we begin. Could you ever imagine being the earthly mother of God the Son? I mean, let your imagination run. You have a boy who never sins. Can you imagine that? He never makes mistakes in all his decisions. He's just perfect. He's your eldest. And before he was born, there was an angel telling you about his ministry, Gabriel. And as he grows up, you see him growing before your eyes. And yet, at the back of your mind, it is, it is always there. This is no ordinary boy. And I just happen to be his mother, but he is not an ordinary man. Ask Mary. And friends, that's just part of the difficulty of raising Jesus. The day Jesus was born, the shepherds visited Mary. Do you remember that? That's a Christmas story, correct? They visited her, and then it says there in Luke chapter 2 that they narrated to Mary everything that was revealed to them by the angels. So you remember what the angels were telling the shepherds? Which they told Mary perhaps word for word. The angels told Mary these words. I am sure they said it more or less exactly the same. Unto you is born this day in the city of David... A Savior, Christ the Lord. If you were Mary, it would dawn on you. The dream of every Jewish mother, friends, was to be the mother of the Messiah. It would dawn on her after Gabriel's announcement and now the angels telling the shepherds and now the shepherds telling her, it's you, Mary. It's you. You are blessed among women simply because it finally happens. The prophecy happens in you and through you. That's Mary. And it says there in Luke 2.19, after the shepherds visited her, Mary treasured up all these things. What things? That a Savior Christ the Lord was born in her and through her. And then pondering them in her heart. I think she probably did that all her life. I think every single event that happened in Jesus' life, Mary was treasuring them up in her heart. And of course, she would see the glory of him being crucified, risen, and then attending the church that her son established after he rose from the dead. Friends, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them with me to Luke chapter 2. We will spend some time there, but not exclusively there, because this is really a character study we're doing today. But in Luke chapter 2, verse 33, it affirms what Luke 2.19 said. It says, his mother marveled at what was said about him by Simeon. In Luke 2.51, his mother treasured up all these things in her heart after the 12-year-old Jesus told her, did you not know I must be in my father's house? Let's ask the Lord to guide our study today. And that God would bless us in our efforts to inspire and honor our mothers. Father, will you be glorified today as we obey the fifth commandment? Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God has given you. And Father, we realize that fulfilling the fifth commandment is honoring to you. Above all, Father, as we talk about Mary, we will realize she never pointed to herself, not once. Her life, Father, is a picture of what she said. My soul magnifies the Lord. All her life, Father, was a tribute to you and to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
May our mothers today keep shining when they look at the life of Mary. If they ever feel discouraged or disappointed somehow, either in their efforts or in the fruit of their womb, Father, encourage them today, we pray. Let them keep shining their lights in their homes. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at five vignettes from Mary's life. What's a vignette? It's a historical snippet. It's a picture from a person's life that we take out as revealed in the Scripture, and then we will look at whatever insights the Scripture tell us about the person, and this is Mary. We will gather insights, and we will use this to honor our mothers today. There are three aspects of good motherhood that we see from Mary's life. What is that? First, we will see her sacrificial commitment. We will also see her sacrificial humility, and finally, her sacrificial trust. And we pray that our message both honors and inspires all mothers today to keep shining like Mary did. Friends, our entire message today answers this question. How did Mary keep shining her light as a mother? It is by her sacrificial commitment, her sacrificial humility, and sacrificial trust. And mothers, I address our biological, adoptive, and spiritual mothers, you can do this. You can do this. Kaya muto. You can do this. You can do what she did. Let's learn from her life. And maybe, just maybe there are fathers here who could actually say, you know what? I know that applies a lot to my wife, but I'm learning a lot too. Not just dads, but future dads, future moms. Let's look at the first two vignettes that talk about a mother's sacrificial commitment. Mary accepted her son unconditionally despite knowing the pain it would cause her. What are you talking about, Pastor? What pain? Let's begin with the Annunciation. Remember what the Annunciation is? This is when the angel Gabriel was sent by God with a message from Mary. Emphasis on this. This was not Gabriel's words. An angel does not compose messages. He just relays them. So when we look at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, friends, the Annunciation will actually be telling Mary the implications of her pregnancy in their conservative culture. Quick review. What happened? Well, Gabriel appears to Mary and tells her, you will conceive and have a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And then he enumerates the ministry of Jesus. That's good. Mary, of course, responds with a natural question. Uh, how will this happen? I'm a virgin. She was engaged to Joseph, but they had never come together physically. How will it happen? That's a natural question, isn't it? Gabriel answers, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, for nothing will be impossible with God. Mary, you have nothing to do with this. This is all the work of God. You will be special. But it will be all of God. It will be the work of God, the Holy Spirit, and the power of God. Because nothing is impossible with God. You remember Mary's answer? You know, I preached about this before in Christmas. In a previous message, she said, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That is surrender and that is commitment. Why do we say that this will give her pain? Because there would be an immediate scandal. Friends, you must understand, that's why she asked the natural question. How can it be? I, I haven't been with any man. No one has touched me sexually. How can I be pregnant? She was perhaps asking herself in her mind, what will this cost me? Scandal. People will, at the very least will be asking her, what kind of a, what kind of a woman are you? Why were you unfaithful to Joseph? Immediate scandal. Or why couldn't you contain yourself until the day of your wedding? That's very disgraceful. But did you know this? Mary's scandal would go beyond her pregnancy. It's implied in Scripture, friends, that all throughout the life of Mary and Jesus, there was an implied scandal. She cared with her all her life. You know, people are perhaps whispering in the background, oh, there goes Mary. Remember her story, 
her fictional story. She got pregnant without anyone touching her. Do you really believe that? Oh, come on. It would hound her all her life. So it wasn't just an immediate scandal. It was a lifelong one. What else? Well, at the very least, she risked Joseph breaking off the engagement. And you know that almost happened, right? Joseph almost broke off the engagement, but not because he was a coward, but because he wanted to honor her. And one more, she risked perhaps even death. In their conservative culture, even though they were under Roman rule, because they were living in a rather backward town called Nazareth, they could, you know, the, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers could pretend they didn't see it happen. They could have stoned her to death. That was Mary. Friends, the Annunciation was not a small thing to her. One more. Aside from the Annunciation, the second vignette that talks about her sacrificial commitment is found in the prophecy of Simeon. At the temple, so Jesus is born miraculously from a virgin. And Luke 2, 25 to 35, they brought Jesus to the temple after his circumcision for his dedication. I was just talking to a couple at the back over there this morning. I, I told them, I did the wedding of this couple. And I saw for the first time back there, the baby, the precious gift of love to this couple. And I told them, I hope we can dedicate this baby. Whether I do it or one of the pastors or one of the elders, I hope we have this baby dedicated. That's what happened to Jesus. They were going to dedicate him, and there was a man named Simeon in our story. He was a righteous and devout man who received a message from God. What message? Simeon, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah. Why is that? Because he was a righteous and devout man who was waiting for the Messiah, and in the Old Testament, before the coming of Jesus, everyone who looked forward to the Messiah was a believer. They were saved by faith, like we are saved by faith today. And this was a believer, and God told him, you're going to see the Messiah. And when Mary brought Jesus to the temple, I like this. Can you again let your imagination, and it says there, Simeon took Jesus in his arms. Can you imagine? An eight-day-old Jesus in an old man's arms. And what does the old man say? He gives a prophecy. And the final words of his prophecy are like this. Lord, you're letting now your servant depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. He's giving credit to the Messiah. He was saying, I recognize he is the promised Messiah. And then he said to Mary, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and these are the words I want you to remember, a sword will pierce through your own soul. What does that mean? Mary, raising this child and being his mother, will tear your heart apart. And it's not just the immediate scandal. It's not just the lifelong scandal of having rumors by the neighbors, chismes, gossip, more than that, it will be fulfilled at the cross when she will see her son in apparent failure, a great teacher, now stripped naked, and a sword will pierce through your own soul. And she just realized the early part of it in our story. Mary was totally aware about what raising Jesus would cost her. She knew, friends, God was not unfair to her. Mary knew raising this special special son of God as the earthly mother who tear her heart apart. She knew that early, my friends. But she was committed to it because her attitude was this. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Every time a child is born to a mother, whether biologically, by adoption, or spiritually, you actually go to the same experience as Mary, moms. You're actually, in a sense, saying, let it be to me. This child is going to be mine, and I'm going to raise him or her. And our children may not be perfect like Jesus, of course. And sometimes they are born with things that might concern us. You know, minor concerns. This boy seems underweight. Or this boy seems overweight. I remember my youngest, when he was born, he was 10.1 pounds. Benjamin. And the nurses didn't know I was in the operating room and in the nursery. 
And they were passing on Ben, you know. Look at this boy. He's like three months old. Yeah. <laughs> so some others might be concerned with that. He's overweight. He's underweight. He's rather long. He's rather short. He's one year old. He's not walking. He's three years old. He's not talking and so on. Sometimes our children are born with things that even break our hearts. I say this without trivializing the pain of mothers who are born with children who have congenital problems, Down syndrome, blindness, cerebral palsy. Or sometimes our children are born perfect physically. And then they grow up and become teenagers and young adults and they do something that breaks your heart. They don't honor your values. They don't carry them. Sometimes they turn, your, they turn their backs to the faith to raise them in. What do you do, moms, to keep your light shining? As our faith grows from God's salvation, which Mary talked about in Luke 1, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. As you have the same conversion experience, moms, the same faith in a reliable God helps you bear the inevitable sacrifice of parenting. What is that? To be committed to raising this child. Even if he or she has broken or will break your heart, you say in your heart, I will raise him up. Even if he was born with this struggle, or even if he was born fine, but now as a teenager, as a young adult, I have nothing but tears because of him or her. And what will carry you through and keep your light shining, moms? As you're committed to God as His servant, you can be committed sacrificially as you realize God is for you, not against you in your parenting. Mary said, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That's where you begin, with the saving knowledge of Christ. And then you continue with that same faith that God is on your side and He will help you raise that son or daughter even if you know or even if already he or she is breaking your heart. A mother's sacrificial commitment. What else do we learn about Mary that I hope will keep your light shining, mothers? Our next two vignettes are about a mother's sacrificial humility. A mother's sacrificial humility. Mary took her son's growing assertion of his supremacy over her with humility. So Mary was committed, right? This son, I know, will break my heart. Somehow, someday. He had already started tearing her heart apart when she knew there would be a scandal connected with him. But here, in the next two vignettes, we will see that the boy Jesus, and eventually the grown man Jesus, would begin to assert his supremacy over her, and she would receive this with humility. Will you turn your Bibles now to Luke chapter 2, verses 41 so 51, as we talk about, again in the early life of Jesus, the 12-year-old Jesus when he was left behind at the temple. When he was 12, I'll just summarize this, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem. There was an annual feast. The annual feast was a celebration. It was a joyful occasion. And I believe, and you, can, you can perhaps have another view, I believe it was their parents' fault that Jesus got left behind. I don't think Jesus was a rebellious teenager. I hope you don't get that impression. I think the parents just presumed, oh, he's in the caravan. You see, if, if relatives went to Jerusalem, it was always a big occasion. It was a clan. And it reminds me of my own clan gatherings uh, before my sisters, two of them, went to, to another country. We would have a big clan gathering every Christmas. I, I think that was the same thing here. A big caravan, and Mary and Joseph assumed, oh, Jesus is with us. He wasn't. He was at the temple, and uh, they found him in the temple after three days because it takes perhaps several days to travel back, and he was in the temple among the teachers listening and asking questions, and Mary said what every mother would say. I mean, if you were a mom, what would you say to your child who's been missing three days? You'd be upset, wouldn't you? <laughs> she was. Look at her words. Uh, Son, why have you treated us so? Your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. 
Remember what Jesus said to them? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? What's happening here? Is this an insolent boy talking to his mom? No. This is a boy telling them that I want you to realize that you said I am I have been, uh, you know, in a sense remiss with regards to my father, but I, I am actually in my father's house. He was beginning to teach his mother about his ministry. He was in the temple. And besides, uh, he was doing what a good child should do when you're left behind by your parents, right? What do you do? What do you tell your kids if ever you leave them out? You tell them you go to somewhere where there are respectable men where you're expected to be fun. I remember when my eldest son, Arrow, was, uh, you know, we would bring our three kids to a bookstore when they were growing up. You know why? Because I'm a cheapskate. I bring my kids to the bookstore. I tell them, you read anything you like there. We'll leave you alone. Uh, One time, we left him alone in a bookstore, and uh, for some reason, I I lost him. Mea culpa. My fault. You know what? He 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 heeded his mother's advice perfectly well. He was with the security guard because that's what his mother taught him. If you ever get lost from your parents, you go to the security guard. He was there. That's what Jesus did, friends. He was in the temple because that's where they celebrated the Passover. And he was with the teachers, respectable men. And so when he replied to his parents, he was not disrespectful. It reveals his amazement that they did not know where to look for him. They should have looked for him where they left him, at the temple. And it also reveals that even at such a young age, he was fully aware of his identity and mission. And to prove to us that he was not disrespectful, it says here, he went down with them and was submissive to them. He went back to his parents and submitted to them all his life. And it says in verse 51 of Luke chapter 2, Mary treasured up all these things in her heart. What things? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? That's a mother's humility. My 12-year-old is teaching me. He's reminding me of what the angel Gabriel said. He's reminding me of what the shepherds also said. That a Savior is born, Christ the Lord. We're not done yet. The second vignette affirms this, which is vignette number four. Jesus' first miracle at Cana. Look at John chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. So we'll go a little forward in the Gospels and look at John chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. What do we find there? That's the first miracle ever of Jesus at a wedding. What happened in this wedding is, in those days when they celebrated weddings, it was a big occasion. It's not like our weddings here. You know, during this lockdown, I've done quite a lot of weddings, believe it or not. I've had weddings with 12 people, 30 people, 40 people, because, you know, the IATF limited it for good reason. But these weddings were nothing like that. They were not one-hour receptions, two hours. They, They lasted days. And so perhaps after a few days of feasting, they ran out of wine. So Mary, like any mother, goes to the eldest boy. And says, can you do something? Basically, she told him, they have no wine. That's the equivalent of saying, is there anything you can do? Remember, he has not yet done any miracle. We don't know what was going on in Mary's mind. Uh, Jesus, you go somewhere and buy wine. We don't know. But look at the response of Jesus in John chapter 2. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And Mary said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Why is this sacrificial humility? You need to journey with me on this. The word woman is not disrespectful. It's a formal term. It's like, I see my mother sitting here, so I'll be very careful in this sermon, okay? I I respect my mother with all the respect in my heart. But the equivalent of Jesus addressing Mary woman is like me telling my mother, to my praise God for raising me, uh, Mrs. Pabiona. Now, she will say, why are you calling me Mrs. Pabiona? Call me mama. That's the equivalent here. What is Jesus doing? Friends, Jesus is mentoring Mary. He is not disrespecting her. 
But this was the start of his ministry. He was telling Mary, Mary, we're going to the final phase of my life. As the Messiah, he was entering his ministry. Now, that's why he was beginning to establish a distance, a formal distance between them. Mary was being mentored. Jesus was teaching her that he had started his mission so that he subordinated all activities to his mission. She had to recognize Jesus now not just as her son, but as the son of God. Jesus was mentoring Mary when he said, my hour has not yet come He is referring to his death and resurrection. He was on a divine schedule. And perhaps he was referring to the time in the future when wine will freely flow. Perhaps in the millennial kingdom. That's a prophecy, by the way. And he was saying, Mary, that time has not yet come, that that God would make wine freely available. He said, it's not yet because I've not yet been crucified and risen. And what are we learning from these two vignettes here, the 12-year-old Jesus and the first miracle at Cana? We're learning this. Part of motherhood is learning to let go as your children become what they were meant to be. Remember the words of Mary, do whatever he tells you. She was learning. She's a good learner. She was telling the servants, I've just been schooled. I've just been instructed by my own son. Now, whatever he tells you, do it. This is Mary. This is her sacrificial humility. And moms, as you ask a perfect God to bless your imperfect efforts through prayer, I pray you'll be able to let them spread their wings and live out God's will in their life because it will come. Mothers, there will come a time in your children's life when you will have to realize this is not the little boy I changed diapers for. This is not the little girl who will ask me, Mom, can I borrow your lipstick at three years old? She's now a teenager. She's now a young adult. She's now getting married. And I have to admit that. And sometimes I will have to simply, simply accept this as a fact I remember when the pandemic started. Do you remember how the pandemic began? When we had our lockdown, you know, uh, it was the children's turn. When you were coming home, you know, sometimes my my children would ask me, where did you come from? Who have you been? Uh, Who have you been with? Uh, Did you expose yourself? (laughs) You know, it takes some humility to tell your children, why are you telling me? I'm your dad. We're, we're your parents. No, they're right. Where have I been? Have I exposed myself to the COVID virus? In a sense, you begin to understand what Jesus and Mary were going through. And in her humility, Mary realized, my son is teaching me. My son is mentoring me. Mothers, we can never do a perfect job, can we? But through prayer, ask a perfect God to bless your imperfect efforts, and with your humility, you'll be able to see and be proud of your children as they spread their wings and live out God's will in their lives. Last but not least, our last vignette, it talks about a mother's sacrificial trust. We already saw her sacrificial commitment. We have seen her sacrificial humility. Look at her sacrificial trust, beloved. As Mary accepted her son's endorsement to another caretaker, trustingly, Jesus' endorsement at the cross happens, and you can turn your Bibles there now to John 19, 25 to 27. John 19, 25 to 27 talks about the time that Jesus was crucified on the cross. And again, I'd like you to let your imagination run. You, you're Mary, moms. You're Mary. You followed your son's life. Remember how he started? Miracle. Cana. But there he mentored you and taught you, I'm beginning my mission on earth. My relationship with you is changing. And now, you watched him as crowds followed him, starting with 12. The 12 became several hundred. The several hundred became more than 5,000 as he fed them miraculously. 
And then the, perhaps the highlight of your son's career, quote unquote, was when he entered Jerusalem, the entire Jerusalem, perhaps, it seemed at least, was cheering, Hosanna, Hosanna. And now, you're at a cross. And your son is hanging naked. He's being executed like a common criminal. What goes on in a mother's mind when you see your son an apparent failure? You need to imagine what Mary felt at that time. And at the cross in John 19, 25 to 27, when Jesus saw his mother and John, the beloved, standing nearby, I want to stop here because this impresses me. Mary is shown as a mom because of her commitment and her humility, and it shows even here. Some mothers would not show up at their children's apparent failure. Some mothers would probably recoil at seeing his blood and hearing the mocking crowd saying, if you are the son of God, come down from there and save yourself. But she is beside the cross. She will not leave her son whom everyone is calling a failure. And Jesus says to his mother, woman, again a term of respect, a formal term. Woman, behold your son. Mary, I love you. I am deciding for you as your son. Someone going to take care of you. And then he tells John, John, this is your mother from here on. And it says, from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. He adopted her. This is the loving endorsement of Jesus at the cross to John. And this is what it means for us moms. At a certain stage in life, we must learn to trust the children we raised, to lead us, to make decisions for us. That can be hard. That can be hard. When your children not just flap their wings, but they actually say, I need to decide on the house for you, mom. I need to decide on what to do with dad for you, mom, because we love you. I care about you. It's hard for you to carry this alone. Mom, trust me. That's what Jesus is doing. And Mary, to her credit, trusts her own son. It is often unsettling to let our children lead us or to trust their decisions for us, but we must. I have three grown children, two millennials and one Gen Z at home. And I'm beginning to realize more and more they're making their own decisions. And one day they'll probably make decisions for me. When I'm too old to make decisions wisely for myself, I have to accept that. My wife has to accept that as part of humility and as part of trust. And mothers, you can. You can when you've raised them right. You need to trust your own children. And it happens when you bring them up according to Ephesians 6, 4. And what is that? in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. How did Mary keep her light shining? Because of her sacrificial commitment, her sacrificial humility, and now her sacrificial trust. Let's close with these words. It says, she kept these things in her heart. She probably did all her life. May I be very clear about a specific doctrinal issue as we close? Because the Bible speaks so plainly in 1 Timothy 2, 5, we believe there's only one God and one mediator between God and man. His name is Jesus Christ. I'm saying this because there are some of us who have different persuasions, different backgrounds, and you must be saying, Pastor, are you beginning to honor somebody so much today? No, no, don't get me wrong. We honor Mary as the earthly mother of God, the Son. But even this lady herself spent all her life as a tribute to God. And Paul is now teaching in his, us in 1 Timothy 2, 5, Mary is not the mediator. The mediator, the only one authorized by God, is God the Son himself, Jesus Christ. Acts 4, 12 says the same truth. 
There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Why do I emphasize this? This is where Mary started. Mary was a believer in God. And she was a believer in her own son. But the exemplary motherhood of Mary reminds us that God has lovingly given us a historical example of how someone pulled off the most difficult motherhood task in history. How did Mary pull it off? All her life, she magnified God, never herself. Is there any account here in your Bibles where Mary said, I want you to look at me, okay? I want you to honor me, venerate me, remember me, and remember I can help my son. It never happened. It never, ever happened. She did the opposite. All her life, it was about her son. Mary never magnified herself. It was always about her son. This is because she had put her faith in God, my Savior, as we just read in Luke 1, 46 to 47, Have you done that, moms? Have you done that, dads? Have you done that, kids? Have you put your faith in Christ as your Savior? Because if you have, that's where we all begin. Our power to become the kind of mothers and fathers and parents we should be, to become the kind of people we should become from God. And it begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And moms, if you've done that, then God is for you, not against you. Moms, if you've done that, then God will help you, empower you to have the sacrificial commitment, the trust, and the humility to keep your light shining in your homes. Keep shining, moms, and happy Mother's Day to all our mothers. As we close our message today, May I request all our mothers who are here, again, biological, adoptive, and spiritual, to please rise, to please stand. Biological, adoptive, spiritual moms, to please rise. Let's give them a round of applause. Yes, come on, everybody. Let's do this. Praise God for you. Please remain standing, remain standing. Because two things are going to happen. Number one, our ushers will be giving you tokens of appreciation. And number two, after I pray for you, there will be a song to honor you. Will you please join me, those of you sitting down in praying for our moms. Will you raise your right hand towards them as I pray for them? Let's pray. Father, thank you for our mothers. In my own heart, I thank you for my mother. As she listens to me, Father, I wonder what goes on in her heart. Because she remembers all the foolishness, all the stupidity that I had exhibited to her all her life. And now she listens there. And I am her pastor. Lord, thank you for her life. I would not be here if not for her. Thank you for my own wife, Lord. I have never seen someone sacrifice herself as much. And I pray that my three children would show the blessings of our sacrifice. Lord, in the very same way, we honor every single mother who is here, biological, adoptive, and spiritual. Lord, they have sacrificed. The nature of their ministry is really sacrifice. I pray you give them the strength to keep doing that, to keep their light shining. And there may be some of them who are going through hard times right now, There may be some of them for whom Mother's Day is actually painful to remember. If there are children who have broken their heart, or maybe there are children here who remember a less than perfect motherhood experience. But Father, I just pray you inspire them by the example we've seen in the life of Mary. And may they keep their light shining, O God. Lord, remind them that you are for them in their motherhood. And you will enable them to do even the seemingly impossible. Lord, bless them, we pray. And thank you for the life and how they've sacrificed to make us what we have become. 
And may this song, Lord, that is sung for them to honor them, as well as this prayer, be our way of saying, thank you, moms. Keep your light shining. Thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen.